Gracias, Amaro. Thank you very much. Thank you. Buenos días, everybody. How are you? Good. All right. I'm testing your English. Um, better than my Spanish. Um, what a pleasure for me to be here. Can you all see? Here, you want me to stand up? Is that better? There, I stand up. Um, it's a real uh, pleasure for me to be here, Mr. President, Senator Walker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And thank you very much for opening the Congress. And my friend, Geraldo Munoz, is doing a spectacular job as your Minister of Foreign Affairs. And he is also, in the open, an environmental activist. And I love it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, you should applaud for him, because he's doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Heraldo very accurately described the challenge that we face, not that we face up here or that you face down there, but that we face together. And it's not just you, students here in Chile. It's everybody on the planet who needs to understand how significant the challenge for all of us is today, because we're behind, we're late to this challenge. And there are three most significant parts of this challenge. One, all of the world's fisheries are either overfished or about to be overfished. There's so much money in so many countries, so many people, every restaurant you think of, in every city in the world, wants to serve fish. And there's so many people looking for fish as their main diet. For many, many people in the world, about three billion, fish is the main food, the main source of protein. And there are about 600 million fishermen, all and women, all around the world, going out and hunting fish. The problem is there are also people Al fishing Presidente. illegally, unregulated, vast areas Presidente. of the ocean where people go out and they use Presidente. fishing methods that have Presidente. been prohibited. Let me give you an example. In the 1990s, when I was in the United States Senate, I learned about drift net fishing, which is where they would drop thousands of miles of this monofilament fishing netting. And it would trap everything in the ocean. We used to say that it would strip mine the ocean, if you're familiar with strip mining the mining that just totally erases everything in front of it. Well, this would erase every fish in front of it. But guess what? Two-thirds or 50 percent of the fish catch they wouldn't even use. They throw it overboard, kill it and throw it overboard. And they'd take what they wanted. And sometimes these nets would break off and they'd be lost at sea. But guess what? They would continue to fish. And they'd float up to the surface. They'd trap fish. They'd get heavy. They'd float down deep. Crabs and other predators would eat the fish trapped in them. They'd lighten the load. And they'd rise again and fish again. So another senator and I went to the United Nations. And we were able to work with the United Nations and stop that. But guess what? There are illegal people who still do it today. And we don't have policemen in boats out in those unregulated areas. So they bring in their fish, load it into airplanes, and it flies to major cities in the world, and people eat. And they don't even know they're eating illegally. So one of the things we're talking about at this conference is how do we put enforcement in place in difficult places, 
And with modern technology, this should be possible to be able to track fishers, fishermen. One of your groups here, are there any of you who were participating in the Fish Hackathon? Some of you here? Well, the Fish Hackathon is a group of young people here in Chile who put together a new application for smartphones and iPads and so forth, where young people can learn about the sustainability of the fish that they're eating, and they can track the fish and learn whether or not the fish they're eating were caught the way they should be. So one huge problem, the fisheries of the world are in trouble. Second big problem, pollution that Eraldo talked about. But it's not just plastic. There's plastic pollution because people actually leave stuff on the beach or in the streets and a rainstorm comes along and it washes it into the water or they throw it overboard on a ship. And plastic kills marine mammals, kills birds, fish, porpoises. But you also have other kinds of pollution. We, in the United States, we have, you know, uh, fertilizer, you have the same thing. But our fertilizing can take place in states way up in the United States, Iowa, Missouri, Minnesota, different states. And it goes into the rivers and flows into the Mississippi, comes down out of the Mississippi, opens up into the Gulf, and we have 500 miles or more of dead zone where nothing grows, nothing lives. These dead zones are now showing up all around the world. Because if you drip gasoline at a gas station and it rains, the gasoline rolls off the road and goes down into the harbor or into the bay or into the river. So everything we do is connected. How we develop, what kind of buildings you build, what they're built with, where they're built. All of this is critical and people need to think about it. But the pollution is having a huge impact on our oceans. And Arnaldo, you heard about, uh, from Senator Walker, the huge amount of, uh, of refuse out in the ocean. There's a place in the Pacific Ocean, your immediate ocean, where it all collects and it goes around and around in a big current, in a big circle. Unbelievable amounts of plastic and wood and refuse that collects in the ocean. The final danger is climate change and acidification and the warming of the ocean. Because of the CO2 that goes up into the atmosphere, it comes down as rain, drops in the ocean, and it acidifies the ocean. And the acidification creates an acidic effect on lobsters and crabs and crustaceans, clams. And ultimately, it could have a profound impact, not only on that, but on coral reefs, on living reefs and so forth. So all, I want, all we want you to do is join us in an effort to be able to think more about the connection between the things we choose to do and how we choose to live and what it will do in the long term. There are students and activists here in Valparaiso who I gather have come together working with our embassy and together they help to paint a mural, uh, the Caleta Embrio, and I think it was specifically to stop people or to make, create awareness about uh, recycling and, and plastic and, and waste. So my hope is this, that this conference, which we are very, very grateful to Chile and its government for leading for the second year, that is really important. That's global leadership. It's important leadership. And today, Chile's announcements about setting aside over a million uh, kilometers of uh, ocean that will be protected forever is an enormous contribution to this global effort, and I congratulate Chile for doing that. But we, we have to do more, all of us. We have to keep the momentum going so that we can come together 
and protect our oceans. Why? Because our oceans are absolutely essential for life itself. Not just the food, but the oxygen and weather cycles of the planet all depend on the relationship to the ocean. And if we destroy the appropriate God-given cycle of the ocean, then we may injure or destroy life itself here on the planet. There are scientists now who are telling us that the warming of the ocean and the changes of the ice melting in the Antarctic and the Arctic can have a profound impact on the major ocean currents. And those major ocean currents have been critical to the kind of climate that we all have been able to live with. If that changes, I can't stand here and tell you what the impact will be. But I know that when you, when you uh, disrupt such a critical component of the life cycle, you are taking enormous risks. And all of us, if we're aware of those risks, we have a major moral responsibility as a matter of simple precaution not to put future generations at risk. So thank you for coming here to be part of this, and I look forward to answering questions with you. Thank you.